Good morning, folks. Uh, today we're continuing our uh, preliminary discussions of Chapter 1 in uh, the Logic course. Uh, <clears throat> where we left off last time was this conversation about the criteria met by cogent reasoning. Now, <clears throat> we already talked a little bit about this concept. Whoa. We've already talked a little bit about the concept of validity. And admittedly, we have a little bit more to more work to do there. And this is in part because we kind of started a conversation about, about deduction, deductive validity. Our conversation of what is called inductive validity will be a little bit different. The long-winded point I'm trying to make here is the first criterion that has to be met by a cogent or acceptable argument is that it has got to be logically, structurally good. Now we will be talking in the next couple of weeks about the details surrounding some fairly common valid forms and then we will be looking at some invalid forms and hopefully we'll give you a you know, an intellectual kit bag for being able to tell the difference for cases that you haven't seen yet. So first, it's got to meet the validity or structural criterion. Now, the second criterion, and this is all in the book, I'm just spelling it out, the author talks about the premises being believable. And I hope I'm not stating the obvious here, but the author did not want to use the T word, truth. The author didn't want to use the word true premises here. This is perhaps because in many, many cases, it is very difficult to tell definitively whether or not a premise is true 100% for certain. This is why the author asked the question, is the premise or are the premises believable? That is, do you have good reasons to believe that they are the case? If so, it would meet this second criterion here. Now, before I go on, and this is not in the textbook, fairly standard uh, understanding of the three possible truth values that a premise might have. This is not in the book. I think it should be. A premise can be true, and along with truth might come verification standards for determining whether something is true. If I made the claim that it was snowing overnight in central Pennsylvania, you say, well, to me, that statement is most likely true. We've got the evidence before us in our eyes. We had a snow delay today. Some of you had to shovel it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, we don't ask for certainty because, of course, someone could always say what? Hey, how do I know I'm not dreaming? Or hey, how do I know I'm not hallucinating? The question is, are we being reasonable when we ask these questions? Yeah, sure, these things are possible, but are they probable? Yeah, yeah. statements can be true. They can be false. If we have good reason to believe that they're not the case. And if you've taken some other course, maybe it was a math course that covered a little bit of logic, or maybe you've done a truth table somewhere, a math class or somewhere. Yeah, don't worry, we won't be doing that. Here. If you didn't like them, I hope that's good news. But yeah, the truth value also might be undetermined. In other words, where we're not clearly sure whether it's best thought of as true or false. 
And if indeed we're not sure if our premises are true or false, we may want to suspend judgment until more information comes along. Now this doesn't come up in this chapter, but I'll mention, or I should say it doesn't come up directly in this chapter. There are certain kinds of claims that people might make that we call value statements or value judgments. These are the kind of statements that may not clearly be determinable as either true or false because they are not literally statements of fact. This is why we may have to go other routes when trying to verify those kind of statements. Now here's the punchline. If our argument structure is valid, and if our premises are believable, we say that the argument is sound. And another word that's perfectly fine for that is, is cogent. But I will be using the word sound with some frequency in our discussion of deductive arguments. Now, if indeed, an argument meets these two criteria and is determined to be a sound argument. The rational person should consent to accepting the argument, even if you don't like the argument's conclusion. Even if you don't like the argument's conclusion. Yeah. If it passes these tests, it is logically acceptable. Yeah, is that only the case with um, arguments that have premises that are not about validity? Yes. And if we're talking about premises that are value judgments, of course, it might not actually meet this criterion here. In other words, we would have grounds for disputing something. We might say, well, that premise is not clearly true. And if the premise isn't clearly true, then the argument is on sound. N nice question. Yeah, that might be a case for when it doesn't meet these criteria. We'll see some examples very shortly. Now, next thing. The author of the textbook talks a little bit more about two kinds of validity. Put, the, put this in your data banks too. The author speaks of deductive validity and inductive validity. And I want to make a, uh, make a snide remark right now. I don't even like to use the word validity when I'm talking about inductive arguments. And this is because of the way the word valid is typically defined. The way it's typically defined is inconsistent with induction. If an argument is valid and its premises are true, I told you that the conclusion follows by logical necessity. Validity is about the argument structure. Now to give you a couple of no-brainer examples here, If this animal, and this is a deductive example, if the animal is a wallaby, then the animal's a marsupial. Now you notice I'm using abbreviations here. We can because remember, we're looking at the structure. So the content really doesn't matter here. If this animal is a wallaby, then it's a marsupial. This here animal is a wallaby. Guess what conclusion I can draw? Therefore, this animal is a marsupial. Now you probably saw an example of something like this already. It is more clearly elucidated in the second chapter when the author is talking about something called propositional logic. This is one of the most simple deductively valid structures called, and I know at least one of you has probably heard of this before. If you looked ahead, I know you also saw this. 
This is one of the simplest, most basic deductively battle structures called modus ponens. This is a Latin phrase, and it literally translates to something like affirming the antecedent. This front end of this statement, this statement is an if-then statement. I think I told you this before. We call these statements conditionals. If the front side of this happens to be the case, then the consequent will follow. Right here, the second premise affirms this part, the antecedent. The conclusion follows biological necessity. Now keep in mind, the structure is a valid structure. And if it meets that second criterion, that is that the premises are true, then this conclusion will necessarily be true. Give you another example. If the government shutdown continues for a great deal longer, then there will be severe economic consequences. It's likely to continue for quite a bit longer. Therefore, there's likely to be severe economic consequences. This is the same structure. This is modus ponens. If the premises are clearly true, the conclusion will follow by logical necessity. Now, I think I gave you a similar example before we left in another lecture that used this very similar example, except it looked like this. If the government shutdown continues for a great deal longer, then there will be se severe economic consequences. But we can't have severe economic consequences. Therefore, it better darn well end soon. This is a valid structure called modus tollens. We'll talk in the next chapter about why it's deductively valid. I'm just showing you this as a deductively valid structure. As long as there are true premises plugged into a valid structure, the conclusion will follow by logical necessity. In other words, it's not a matter of opinion. It's not up for debate. Deductive arguments are either valid or they're invalid. There is no maybe about it. And if you think there's a maybe about it, you don't have enough information to make the determination is what you mean. By the way, folks, deductive arguments, you might also hear referred to as this. You might also hear the phrase formal reasoning used. Now, the reason why we call it formal reasoning or formal logic is because the main thing that we will be analyzing when we do this kind of reasoning is, is the structure. We will be examining whether or not the structure of the argument is a good one. If it's not a good logical structure, we say that the argument is invalid. Well, suppose that you have an invalid structure, and just because of the way the darn thing is set up, the premise turns out to be true. Does that mean the argument's valid? No. Sometimes out of happenstance, you throw true premises into a, an invalid argument. Sometimes a true statement comes out the back end. But remember, if an argument is a sound one, it's got to meet all of those criteria. If any mistake has been made along the way, it is unsound. Now, that was a brief account of deductive validity. We will be looking at more deduction in the next uh, upcoming chapter. Inductive arguments. We say that an inductive argument's conclusion 
We say that its conclusion is supported by Now you'll notice that that is a much weaker statement than the one I just made with regard to, the, uh, to deduction. If we have an induct, a good inductive argument, its conclusion is said to be supported by the provided evidence, not necessitated. <coughs> now the reason why we can only say this is because inductive arguments are structurally different. The relationship between the premises and the conclusion are different. And this is why they can only provide likelihood or reasonability. Now, I'll go for some fairly easy examples to make the distinction. I'm pretty sure that when I go out to my car at the end of the day, that when I turn the ignition, yeah, I don't have push button, yeah, I gotta turn it. Yeah, if I turn the ignition, that the thing is going to start. Now, what evidence might I give? Well, the battery's not all that old, and it's been starting strong, you know, very consistently recently. Now you'll notice that's not proof that it's going to start when I go out there. But I've given you what I would call good reasons to believe that the thing will start when I go out there. <clears throat> I've given you good reasons to believe. I haven't given you full proof or certainty. So with inductive arguments, what we do is we support our position. Now folks, there's plenty of different kinds of inductive arguments that are out there. Many of them, <clears throat> what should I say, will involve things like statistics. Many of them will involve causality. Many of them will involve things like analogies to try to draw conclusions. These do not provide full proof. These, what we do, these provide what we will call good reasons for accepting a position, provided that the premises are true, or to use the author's phrase, believable, that they are relevant. I'm going into a little bit more detail than the text. Provided that they are true, relevant, and I'll also add here, sufficient. And when I say sufficient, I'm talking about have I provided enough evidence? Now, unlike with deduction, when determining whether or not it's a valid argument is pretty cut and dried, with inductive arguments, our evaluation will probably involve looking at the fuller context of the argument. In other words, we will have to look at how strong our conclusion happens to be, and that will likely determine how much, how much evidence I will need. I hope that was a good, clear start. Now, what might be cases where we use induction on a daily basis? I'll go, I'll go uh, boring here. Suppose you're just starting a course. I don't care what your course is. And you find that your instructor shows up about five minutes late every day for the first week of class. Based upon those late arrivals, you might induce that this guy's got a problem with punctuality, or woman, I didn't say. You might think your instructor's got a punctuality problem. Well, guess what? Because you don't know all of the surrounding circumstances, you may not want to make that generalization too quickly. It's based upon just three cases. I mean, something odd might have been going on that week for this person. However, 
when patterns like that start to develop, it becomes reasonable to draw that conclusion I make. Hey, this guy must have a punctuality problem. Or suppose you have an instance where your instructor fails to respond to your email in a week. Perhaps he just what? Perhaps it somehow got overlooked. Perhaps somehow it went into a spam folder or whatever. It might be a hasty generalization to induce that this guy doesn't return emails based upon what? Based upon one case where perhaps you don't have the surrounding information. This is why evaluating inductive arguments you know, might involve not just the information that's there, it might also include considering the other relevant information that might not be there. So having an understanding of context might help here. Now I hope I didn't go, which I hope I didn't go overboard there. Yeah, Simeon. Yeah, the uh, OJ Simpson case, for example, was inductive argument. Well, legal reasoning is fairly interesting. It depends what aspect of it that you were that you were talking about. As a matter of fact, I would call it an argument from strong induction. Because in, in cases of criminal investigation, the people who do this stuff have induced on, on good so, uh, solid statistics that most crimes, not all, but a large number of these, those kind of crimes involve people who knew the victim. And this is one of the reasons why you watch these, how many of you watch crime drama shows? Yeah, I'll admit I like to watch these British crime drama shows. But typically, one of the first suspects is almost, you know, if it's, a, uh, if it's a, someone's wife who was killed, one of the first persons of interest will be the husband. Because they've seen that in these kind of cases, yeah, you know, there's almost always some kind of I mean, people don't behave for no reason at all. It's you, you know, these kind of killings usually are not random. So yeah, so understandably, we would induce well, and then plus when what? Ah, he's he's running away. You know, you know the, the Bronco police chase. Yeah, I was working in a bar at the time when that took place, and everyone was staring at the screen as <laughs> driving down the highway in the Bronco. And of course, there was plenty of circumstantial evidence. His DNA was all over the place. We induce that your DNA doesn't get all over the place unless you were but you were there. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, in these kind of investigations, a lot of induction does go on. And this is, of course, why we make a case with, you know, we want a whole lot of this inductive evidence because if tons and tons of inductive evidence piles up, it's not quote unquote 100% proof. But sometimes the, the weight of the inductive evidence gets so strong and no other explanations make sense. They have to say, yeah, it must have been this guy. Yes. So then let's say there was a crime captured on tape that you have inductive evidence because there's proof that well, the person. That's a good question. The problem is the what we're presupposing there is <clears throat> that the camera, uh, you know, that the camera's of good quality, that the camera doesn't lie. We also have to be presuppose, I'm not getting too conspiratorial here, that the evidence has not been tampered with, you know, things of this nature. Uh, <clears throat> things like that would also constitute, you know, part of a large evidentiary case against a person. Yeah, the issue is with deduction, it would be structural. 
Let me get, maybe construct a deductive argument centered around an inductively trustworthy piece of evidence. If he was caught on tape at the crime scene, then he's likely guilty. He was caught on tape at the crime scene. Therefore, he's likely guilty. Now you'll notice that this is a deductive argument, but there's kind of a probabilistic assumption made whenever we design this, this argument. In other words, the truth of the premise is based upon an inductive inference. And this is kind of the fodder of chapter two rather than chapter one, but this is a great place to, to mention this. Uh, <clears throat> but very frequently, arguments, real life arguments, will involve both kinds of reasoning. Very frequently. You know, we set this up deductively, but the truth of this premise is perhaps verified on inductive grounds. Arguments within arguments, assumptions within arguments, hopefully stronger than weaker assumptions. Thanks, good question. One more thing I hope I have time for here. Now point A. The author has a short passage where he talks about, or he slash she talks about the wrong ideas about cogent reasoning. That's the title. At this point, the author makes a case against people who argue for various kinds of relativistic logic. Folks, if you've ever heard a person say, well, that may be logical for you, but it's not logical for me. That person, via that statement, has demonstrated that they don't understand the concept of logic. Because if something is logical or not, it is indeed logical. In other words, it's not a what. It's not a matter of opinion. Now, indeed, the truth or falsity of premises at times might be a matter of opinion. But whether or not an argument structure is valid or not is not up for debate. It's not a matter of opinion. Either it's valid or it isn't. Now here the author also begins talking about people who claim that there are different kinds of logic, feminine logic, Different kinds of logic for people of different races or ethnicities. Well, the author quickly says, if people make claims like that, they are basically expressing their ignorance about logic. Because if there's anything in the history of thinking that is objective or as close as we can get to objective, it is indeed logic. Yeah, yeah, it is indeed logic. In other words, it is logic is, is not relative to one's perspective. Now, indeed, the way that we see reality is indeed a matter of perspective, and that's a completely different issue. Because when we analyze things logically, we are looking at things structurally. Now, next time, we will have our conversations about the last bits of the chapter, that discussion about background beliefs and worldviews and the way that they are likely to shape our viewpoints of reality and perhaps our abilities or inabilities to look at <coughs> arguments in an unbiased way. Thanks.